Did you ever wonder if certain foods have a direct effect on your health? Well, I'm here to solve that mystery since you are the foods you eat. Welcome to the Nutrition Facts Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Greger. Back by popular demand, it's our Nutrition Facts Grab Bag, where we look at the science on a whole variety of topics, starting with a story about how to preserve your sense of smell. Based on a study of nearly 2,000 people, our sense of smell declines as we age, similar to our loss of vision and hearing. About a quarter of Americans over the age of 50 suffer from olfactory dysfunction and difficulty identifying odors, which climbs to more than half of individuals between the ages of 65 and 80, and about 80% in those over the age of 80. And that was before COVID-19, which affected the smell of nearly 50% of sufferers, Typically, it was temporary, but as many as 15% of non-hospitalized COVID survivors were still experiencing problems with the ability to smell three or more months later, and there are cases of it lasting for years. As anyone with even a simple head cold can tell you, when you lose your sense of smell, you lose much of your sense of taste as well. Between 75 to 90% of what we think of as taste may actually be smell. This was all too vividly illustrated by the case of Algerian war soldiers whose tongues were cut out were remarkably reporting little loss of food and drink flavor sensation. But hey, if loss of smell leads to loss of taste, think of all the weight loss. And that was apparently the thought behind the development of a novel nasal device, gag-inducing silicone tubes you stick into your nostrils to condom off your smell receptors. Researchers recorded a drop in preference for sugary foods and beverages, along with weight loss, but only among the younger adults, presumably because the sense of smell of the older adults was already impaired. Making everything taste bland may help you skip a few donuts, but the flip side is that people with smelling difficulties tend to add more salt. Older individuals were found to require two to three times more salt than those who were younger to achieve the same salty taste. It's no wonder that the lifetime risk of developing high blood pressure may exceed 90%. What can we do to preserve our sense of smell? Ambient air pollution is associated with olfactory dysfunction, thought to explain why nasal biopsies from residents of Mexico City, living and dead, showed more lesions and inflammatory changes than those living in low pollution cities. We may not have a choice of where we live, but there's definitely a direct source of air pollution tied to loss of smell we can all choose to avoid, cigarette smoke. Smell loss can have serious consequences. For example, uh, missing a gas leak, smoke, or, or spoiled food. If you have lost your sense of smell and use natural gas, please consider buying a gas detector. But in terms of direct disability, most people who are affected don't even seem to be aware their smell is impaired, even when asked directly. Nearly 8 out of 10 elderly individuals with smell loss thought they had normal smell sensitivity. Hearing loss, however, is considered a major cause of global disability, ranking among the top chronic conditions affecting older adults. For far too long, though, as a National Academy of Medicine report put it, hearing loss has been relegated to the sidelines of health care. In our next story, we look at how duct tape beat out freezing and 10 other treatments for the removal of warts. When I was reviewing the science behind common over-the-counter remedies used in dermatology, such as tea tree oil for acne or nail fungus, I was surprised to see on the same page a section on duct tape. Duct tape? <laughs> the only time I remember seeing duct tape used in a medical study was on the identification of the gases responsible for the odor of human farts, which involved a collection system comprised of gas-tight pantaloons sealed to the skin with duct tape. Uh, that's the study where they assessed the windbreaking ability of a cushion called the toot trabber. Uh, but what the Dermatology Journal was talking about is warts. Duct tape brings out our inventive slightly kooky side, given this versatility it wasn't so surprising a few years ago when a group of doctors reported that duct tape could get rid of warts. As I noted in my last wart video, all sorts of strange things are purported to cure warts because most go away on their own. A thousand kids were followed for two years, and two-thirds of the warts disappeared without doing a thing. 
so maybe we should just leave them alone, though there are cases that may warrant treatment. Otherwise, we can just let our own body take care of them. Warts are caused by wart viruses, and so spontaneous wart disappearance is assumed to be an immune response where our body finally wakes up and, and takes notice. This assumption is based on studies where foreign proteins were injected into the wart itself, uh, like a uh, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, straight into the wart, which, compared to placebo, appeared to accelerate the immune clearance process. The problem, of course, is that injections hurt, and 30% of the kids that got their warts injected with the vaccine suffered a flu-like syndrome. Yikes. OK, scratch that. What else do we got? Within a few months, any placebo treatment will work in about a quarter of the cases, so if you put duct tape on 100 warts and you know, 23 go away, that wouldn't mean much. The traditional medical therapies, acid treatments and freezing treatments, bumps the cure rate up to around 50%. So, I mean, if you were really serious about testing the efficacy of duct tape, you would pit it head-to-head -head against one of those, and that's exactly what happened. The efficacy of duct tape versus cryotherapy in the treatment of the common wart. Uh, cryotherapy is one of the treatment of choices for many pediatricians. Objective. To determine if application of duct tape is as effective as cryotherapy in the treatment of common warts. Patients were randomized to receive either liquid nitrogen applied to each wart or duct tape occlusion. When I uh, heard about treating warts with duct tape, I had this image where they were like trying to rip them off or something. No, 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 no. They're just applying a little circle of duct tape every week or so. Although there have been a few anecdotal reports of using tape, no prospective randomized controlled trial had yet been performed until this study, which found that the duct tape was not only equal to but exceeded the efficacy of cryotherapy, uh, which worked in 60% of the cases, but 85% of the duct tape patients were cured, significantly more effective than cryotherapy for treatment of the common ward, more effective and fewer side effects. I mean, the only adverse effect observed in the duct tape group during our study was a small, minimal amount of local irritation and redness, whereas cryotherapy hurts. You want to hear the saddest thing? One young child actually vomited in fear of pain before each cryotherapy session. They were like torching the poor kid. Cryotherapy can cause pain and bloody blisters that can get infected and mess up your nail bed. So, duct tape. More effective, fewer side effects, and more convenient. Compare applying a little duct tape at home to making multiple clinic visits, dragging the poor kid back every two weeks, I Means like a win win win. Duct tape can now be offered as a non threatening, painless, and inexpensive technique for the treatment of warts in children. I mean, that, how much does a little piece of duct tape cost? It's, it's like a win 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 win. Ah, but the money you save is the money the doctor loses. There's no way the medical profession is going to just let this go unchallenged. Further studies were performed and failed to show an effect. And so we end up in the medical literature with conclusions like this. Is duct tape effective for treating warts? Bottom line, no. Huh. Is duct tape really not effective after all? Or was there some kind of critical design flaw in the follow-up studies? And so even if the effectiveness of duct tape is shown to be merely equivalent to that of cryotherapy, it would be better and it was shown to be even more effective. In fact, maybe most effective compared to 10 other wart treatments, duct tape beat out them all in terms of effectiveness and also in terms of cost, cheaper than all but the DN option, which stands for do nothing. Compared to the most effective prescription treatments available, OTC duct tape, meaning over-the-counter duct tape, is 10 times cheaper. It's an unusual and welcome event in healthcare when a common ailment is proven equally amenable to an inexpensive, tolerable, and safe alternative therapy. Finally today, I ask and answer if there really is such a thing as adrenal fatigue. Many seeking treatment for common nonspecific symptoms are led to believe they're suffering from some sort of hormonal deficiency. Adrenal fatigue is the prototypical example Chiropractor coined in 1998, the invented diagnosis has since been embraced by naturopaths, functional medicine, and anti-aging doctors. But does adrenal fatigue even exist? The alleged condition is said to result from chronic stress, leading to an overuse of the adrenal glands and their eventual functional decline. 
Symptoms supposedly include fatigue, body aches, sleep issues, and digestive problems, at least according to the website's not so coincidentally selling a suite of supplements to remedy it. It will come as no surprise that the originator of the term sells supplements on his website to treat it for $200 a month. But it may not be an actual medical condition. The symptoms people have are real, but they just may be caused by something else, for example, sleep apnea or chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. Saliva tests for adrenal hormone levels are not reliable, with studies showing so-called adrenal fatigue patients having higher levels than control similar levels or lower levels, an almost systematic finding of conflicting results. There is an actual disease of adrenal insufficiency known as Addison's disease, which is diagnosed with an ACTH stimulation test. You inject people with adrenocorticotropic hormone, the signal your brain uses to get your adrenal glands to pump out the stress hormone cortisol, and if your adrenals don't respond, that shows your adrenal glands must be in trouble. But inject those presumed to be suffering from chronic stress and fatigue with ACTH, and sometimes you get an even greater rise in cortisol, disproving the notion that stress causes the adrenal to quote-unquote burn out. But wait, you were diagnosed with AF, given corticosteroids, and now you feel great, so it must have been real. Now that's the thing about corticosteroids, though. One of the side effects is a euphoric sense of well-being. The problem is that even low doses can increase the risk of osteoporosis, psychiatric and metabolic disorders, muscle damage, glaucoma, sleep disturbances, and cardiovascular diseases. But wait. You took some quote-unquote adrenal support supplements, checked the labels, confirmed they don't have any hormones, and still felt better. They lie. Researchers checked the 12 most popular adrenal support supplements, and every single one contained hidden hormones, none of which were declared on the product labels. All contained thyroid hormone, and most a steroid hormone as well, pregnenolone, budesonide, androstenedione, progesterone, cortisone, or cortisol. Adrenal fatigue reminds me of what used to be called electromagnetic hypersensitivity, now referred to in the medical literature as idiopathic environmental intolerance attributed to electromagnetic field. Unspecific symptoms supposedly triggered by things like cell phone. There have been at least 46 studies involving more than 1,000 people that claim to be affected, yet when put to the test in blinded trials, the studies near universally failed to show that anyone could even detect the field. Why don't journalists covering these stories mention the data? Because there are snake oil salesmen profiting off the perceived condition, selling all matter of so-called protective gadgets that viciously attack anyone even daring to mention the science, accusing them of denying the reality of people's symptoms. But it's arguably the opposite. They're the ones hindering sufferers from getting to the bottom of what's actually causing their symptoms. Similarly, hawking unproven tests and treatments for adrenal fatigue could delay the diagnosis of a real, treatable condition. We would love it if you could share with us your stories about reinventing your health through evidence-based nutrition. Go to nutritionfacts.org slash testimonials. We may be able to share it on social media to help inspire others. To see any graphs, charts, graphics, images, or studies mentioned here, please go to the Nutrition Facts podcast landing page. There you'll find all the detailed information you need, plus links to all the sources we cite for each of these topics. My latest book, How Not to Age, is out now, which premiered at number two on the New York Times bestseller list. Check it out at your local public library. And of course, all the proceeds I receive from the sale of all my books goes directly to charity. NutritionFacts.org is itself a nonprofit, science based public service where you can sign up for free daily updates on the latest in nutrition research via bite sized videos and articles. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, no kickbacks, strictly non commercial, not selling anything. I just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother, whose own life was saved with evidence based nutrition.